Hey guys, um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, monitoring uh, television stations. It's a project I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, I kind of do this for a living, so um, hopefully I can be professional about it. But um, yeah, we're just going to walk through uh, how that all works uh, and give you a tour of Ichinga, Ichinga 2 along the way. If you're familiar with that at all, um, this should be, a, or not familiar with that at all, this should be a little bit of an introduction. So, um, firstly, I just want to walk through what a television station is and how it actually works because it's all easy to watch TV, but there's a lot of magic that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, it's a whole series of uh, pretty high technology legacy equipment. When I say legacy, I mean it's real video, um, analog, then digital, and really the whole idea of IP video is kind of really only just starting to take hold. So from a very much point of view, there's you know, special cabling, special hardware, all those kind of things. Um, the important thing with broadcast television is keeping a picture on the screen. Um, that might strike you as an obvious thing, um, but for the customers that I work for, they get calls from billionaires if you go black to air, or uh, if something goes wrong with the data or other things like that, people lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in wagering data. So uh, black is bad. It's very different from a web page. You know, you've got a web page. You can have a load balancer and you can balance things around. And you know, if there's, you know, people can click refresh and it all works. Uh, there's no refresh on a television screen. The signal just goes black and people just have to wait. So an outage is very real, a uh, very different kind of uh, situation, despite the relatively technological kind of similarities behind the, behind the screens. So ultimately, what that means is that you have a whole lot of stuff, computers and things, storage. Uh, equipment, very expensive, often very specialized, that generates a relatively small amount of signal. You know, it comes down to a fiber signal on a um, fiber optic line, which is then rebroadcast to millions of people. And we are really worried about, in this talk, the part that generates that signal, the satellite infrastructure and all those kind of things, we don't worry about too much today. So television station roughly works like this. You've got a camera, which is a high-end thing, converts to uh, uh, SDI HD. SDI is a uncompressed video format. So I think a, a, like HDMI, it's digital video on a piece of cable but not encrypted. Um, a recorder will generally convert that to an MXF and there'll be a station format that is the bandwidth and ratio, aspect ratio that the station requires. Um, you may edit or enrich the MXF files. There's meta, metadata that goes into encoding, you know, oh, we just watched this studio, it's this camera or this horse race or this footy match or whatever it might be, or this actual TV show that we're recording in a studio. Um, enrich the data, store it in a media asset management system, store it on a whole lot of storage. So we're talking about petabytes of storage in general, uh, at a minimum. Um, it'll either get played out directly from the MAM or from the recorder, depending on what's happening. Uh, then broadcast out to lots of people or upload to the internet uh, and all those kind of things. So that's roughly a kind of super bird's eye view of how a TV station works. Um, you can fit all of this in half a rack these days, but your average TV station might fit, um, well, the storage alone might be racks and racks worth of gear if it's petabytes. So, um, as I said, petabyte uh, storage required. Uh, you need a staff of people to keep things going. Studio staff, um, video switching people, audio people to make sure levels are right. You're dealing with real world things like I don't know, dogs hitting cameras or birds flying into microphones or all those kind of things. Um, they typically have a very strong security segmentation, which is one of the appeals of iChinga. So a uh, broadcast environment is very restricted. You know, there's firewalls and air gaps and security passes and all those kind of things involved in keeping the broadcast stuff separate from corporate environments. Um, it's not a flat structure at all. Um, the idea being is that it's important and needs to be available all the time. Um, and it's littered with all sorts of industry-specific vendors and terms. Uh, the vendors are important as well. They all produce kind of proprietary hardware and software, uh, some with very old practices, some with new practices, and it's all a bit of a mess, um, all p pushing a particular sort of idea or solving a particular problem. So uh, as an example, this is a, a, a router, a video router. Um, the, they're an A-B pair. There's two pa pairs there, and there's some cable porn to go with it. Um, and that actually is half of it. Um, and as an example, and this, this lets you switch the SDI video from any input and output to the station. So uh, when they say, if you talk to a TV person and say, you know, can I see your router? This is what they'll show you. Uh, it won't be anything from Cisco uh, or anything else like that. <laughs> um, uh, this is a master control room. This is largely what uh, monitoring looks like in a television station today. 
You have people that sit here 24 seven, they work around in shifts. All of the screens display all the inputs and outputs and it's their job using the control software in front of them to determine you know, which camera is gonna be on the screen, which studio's on air, whether it's the A or the B feed and all those kind of things. So there's very much a human interactive element inside the machine. Um, I don't believe any studio has automated their master control room yet. Uh, there are automated studios, but they still always have a staff member present. It's just not worth not having a person involved in that sort of thing. Okay, so again, back to redundancy. Everything, like I said, has an A-B failover. Um, what that means is that all the way up to the point that you send to the satellite and even past there to some extent, you always have two copies of all the data. All of those streams, all the files, all the servers, everything is already redundant um, and, and because of its importance that I covered before. Uh, television stations are going through a digital revolution like lots of places. Um, this first is the output of, a, um, of Fox Sports. Those SNMP values are the dB on a fiber optic cable that goes from Fox Sports to Foxtel. That one, each one of them represents a channel. So that's the you know, signal to noise ratio. Uh, effectively, that plug-in really kind of represents the actual output of an entire organization worth hundreds of millions of dollars because if the, the value increases to the thing, then we go back to air. So that's kind of cool. They're all also moving towards, uh, you know, digital things. They've got Docker and they're doing digital video and all that sort of things. And that revolution is happening and we've been monitoring those things along the way and helping uh, go through that change with them. So why Ichinga 2? Um, it's very different to Ichinga 1 which is a, a fork of Nagios. Um, you can pronounce it either of those things however you like, thank you very much. Um, the, uh, I, I believe it's robust and flexible. Uh, what that means is that it handles failure well, it validates its configuration and object stores um, uh, nicely. It's distributed and scalable, that means that you can have a multi-master, master-slave, parent-child uh, relationship. Um, easy plugins, same as Nagios, and obviously it's open source all developed on GitHub uh, with open um, you know, source processes. So distributed monitoring is a very important process, uh, idea with Ichinga 2. Uh, effectively what that means is that you have a uh, API on the daemon that is uh, HTTPS port 5665, you've got a, C C a certificate authority on the machine and then you can delegate you know, uh, checks, configuration and uh, even uh, share uh, check execution between multiple instances on the same certificate authority. Um, it's very important to, if you want to achieve scale. Um, the largest installation of Ichinga 2, I believe, is running at somewhere near 400,000 hosts, um, and, which is ginormous. Um, and obviously, um, I think that's for a train station or a Deutsche Bahn, perhaps. Um, and it's also running on uh, the International Space Station, which is kind of cool, monitors astronauts. Um, I'll, and I'll wander through some of that things. The other, other reason to pick it is that configuration syntax is all uh, new and different. I don't know if anyone's familiar here with, everyone familiar with Nagios syntax? That kind of thing, cool. Um, so we've got uh, apply rules instead. You know, there's obviously lots of other differences. It's not, you can't just cut and paste the config. These are some complicated roles, which I think even Matt wrote, actually. Um, they're not actually used uh, at, at these TV stations, but just to give you an example, you can assign variables to hosts in your configuration. You have a host and a service, and the service definition can mix and match those host variables and use logic to build a complicated pattern match of, uh, you know, if this machine has the role IMAP and it's a mailbox for a Zimbra thing, but it's not some other thing. Matt can explain it. Um, you can go through there. Thanks, Matt. Um, so this is the actual architecture back onto how it works uh, at, at Sky Racing. The, um, there's a master instance uh, which has the database um, and the web pages and dashboards associated with it, connects out to Ops Genie over the internet, um, and then there are other nodes which checks get delegated to. So the important thing is there's a firewall between the corporate environment where the master runs and the broadcast environment. The configuration is centralized on the master and the uh, you know, checks and the configuration pass through port 5665 on the firewall, so you can delegate checks to a, another environment without having to do a lot of paperwork to get holes punched in the firewall for, um, to get your monitoring set up. Uh, because there's a whole lot of you know, very restricted and often particularly insecure 
hardware and software running in the broadcast environment. So we need to have a you know uh, sensible way of dealing with that. Um, I think that makes sense to most people. The uh, you know sort of DMZ approach. Um, once you've decided to monitor lots of things, you need a way of expressing it to real people. These real people, you know, whose job it is is to actually make these systems work. This is a screenshot of a NAGVIS dashboard from Fox Sports. What this does is let us um, group together all the various systems, and this is a screenshot from any particular day, uh, which go into monitoring. Uh, each of these boxes represents sort of thousands, well not thousands, up to hundreds of checks of various vendor equipment and that might be um, uh, vendor specific. And the reason for that is there will be a team of people that are responsible for dealing with that particular vendor. So we've structured the monitoring um, overview and this is on screens around the organization and even in the master control room. And they can very quickly go, oh, there's a problem with that particular stack, I'll call this guy. Or there's a problem with this other one, I'll call that guy. And you know, I'm not gonna walk through all the details, but you know, if the internet goes down, then the core connectivity and the network goes red and they call the network guy, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's an important idea that communicating uh, your outages on an aggregate level so that other you know, teams in the business can see what's happening and then being able to drill down, and these are all clickable and you can drill down and get more detail as required um, is important. One of the things that I find reduces the time of outages is a quick way of diagnosing uh, what's, uh, what, what area of it's wrong. You know, is the internet down, why is that? pick and choose uh, the various and narrow it down quite quickly. Uh, here's another dashboard I did for TSM. Uh, this monitors some 25, uh, less than 25 petabytes worth of storage. Uh, got a tape robot, got a, a camera embedded. Um, and a good example of what we can do with iChinga is the idea of having uh, database queries. So these, um, you can see here, the tape pools, the A and B tapes. They're cool, the A tape's a little bit under warning, we're gonna go buy some more A tapes. Um, and that's a DB2 query that I'm running uh, you know, from Linux through an iChinga plugin, uh, works wonderfully. Um, I've got a cool demo here of a map I did for Sky Racing, if I can drag this on. Um, figure out how multi-monitors work. Cool. Uh, whoops, wrong window. Um, this is a map, so Sky Racing sends satellite data to all the pubs. If you go into a pub and you want to bet on things, you can see Sky Racing channel there. This is using the uh, iChinga2 maps add-on to have an interactive map of all the pubs in Australia. And I can tell you whether they're online or offline, if they're undergoing renovations or not, uh, get their address. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, and it does actually have a real world value because um, they need to track whether or not uh, the satellite receivers are behaving correctly and, um, and what's going on. This is a sort of JavaScript mapping add-on. And again, um, the configuration for this is actually relatively easy to do. You simply add a variable called geolocation to the host definition and the map just works. You point it at it and it just maps all the hosts. Um, I suppose it's not particularly many people that have hosts in such a geographical dispersed area. Um, these are you know, real places with real people. Um, and uh, it's kind of cool. And the repair department for these satellite receivers uses this map to figure out whether they're working or not, whether or not they just need to send a truck out there. One of the cool features or problems that we had with this was that one of the guys in the repair department was colorblind, so he didn't know if they were working or not. Uh, so we actually developed a, a theme uh, for iChinga, which lets you have a proper colorblind palette so he can get his job done and see you know, whether or not that satellite receiver is behaving the way uh, he expected or not. Uh, so that's that. Um, moving on to, oops, more things. Where are we? All right. Some of the other integrations we did was with other monitoring systems. Um, there was an existing Zabbix system in one place we used, which monitors all the thousands of network switches and things like that, very much SNMP. Other legacy SNMP front ends, other web interfaces of clusters. So you've got big uh, clusters of gear that come with a vendor interface. We aggregate them through iChinga and then send them out through the dashboards and Ops Genie. Uh, we wrote a whole bunch of plugins. Uh, if anyone recognizes any of those words, happy to talk to you about it afterwards. I'm running out of time. Um, we also spent a lot of time worrying about notifications and getting signal to noise ratio right. And again, you can use variables and, and the same syntax to narrow that down. 
so you can avoid excess uh, notifications about ballistic missiles. We're not monitoring for those. Um, we also built a plugin to integrate with RT. Uh, kind of running out of time. I'd love to go into that in detail. But effectively, what that does is mean that tickets are created once and then commented on as the status goes through. Uh, very important. Um, and we learned a bunch of lessons along the way. Signalist noise is very crucial. Don't write a check if no one will listen to it. Uh, don't be afraid to write plugins because they're very handy and not very hard. And do keep them in revision control. Uh, if you want to get people to listen to you when you're building stuff, uh, there's two approaches. You could start with the people at the bottom or the management. Most people start with people at the bottom trying to make things work for them. Switching to a top-down approach doesn't always work. Dealing with the people who actually need to listen to the alerts is the important thing. So ideally, uh, when you build stuff and it's green, it really is green, no false, false uh, negatives. Um, and also, when you're building a project, figure out how you're going to monitor it. Uh, you know, supporting things once they're built, knowing whether they're working the way you expected, just like test-driven software development, I believe in monitoring-driven infrastructure. So that really covers it. Thanks a lot to Fox Sports and Sky Racing, and thanks for your time. I know that was a bit rushed. Thank you.